Um, my name is Aiden Smith and I'm the director of the Newcomb Scholars Program. Thanks to everybody who is uh, joining us today. And um, I'm joined by my colleague, Lori Arnold, who's a uh, Newcomb Institute staffer, who is um, the queen of all of our events and all of our logistical efforts and has um, supported many of our programs over the years that she's been here. And I'm happy that she's helping us out with recruitment this year. Um, and I've got, I believe, two or three current Newcomb scholars who are going to be um, available. Sophie Sanchez, Abby Bean. Um, Sophie is a current sophomore. Abby, you're a senior, is that right? Abby is a senior. And then I believe we have another student on as well, or she may be joining us shortly. Um, so um, we'll go through our my slides and answer questions. Uh, I'm happy to answer questions either in the chat or as they come up. Uh, and then we'll have some time at the end for current um, for current students to talk to our current scholars and sort of have that conversation as well. And I'll also just in full disclosure, I have three kids that are homeschooling and have no sense of boundaries. So they may be in and out at any moment or if you hear like really bad clarinet in the background, that might be someone as well. So, um, okay, so to that end, um, and Lori, you'll just let folks in as they join in. Okay, cool. So I'm gonna try and share my screen. Okay, and I'm gonna share my screen. Let's see. Let's see. All right. Okay, is everyone able to see that? The screen share? Okay, great. So, um, so just a brief overview of what we'll talk about today. Um, we'll talk a little bit about what Newcomb Institute is. Some of you um, may have family members that are Tulane alums or um, so are familiar with Newcomb or you've got relatives or you know or you just are really familiar with us so some of this might be overview for folks but um but i'd like to sort of contextualize what the institute is in regards to the university um we'll talk about the scholars program what the components are the classes and um obviously the individual requirements and then you know the benefits essentially why um what's in it for you why are so many students interested in the program um, and I'll, I think that's a really great place for the students, the current students to talk about that, what the application process looks like, um, and then any, well, there'll be plenty of time at the end for any questions that anyone has. So, um, so Newcomb College uh, was founded in 1886 as the first women's coordinate college uh, in the country. And so through a gift from Josephine Louise Newcomb, um, that endowed the college. Tulane University was able to have a college for women, um, New Sophie Newcomb College, and then a college for men, Paul Tulane College. Uh, and so this model, this was, Newcomb was actually the first in the country to move forward with this model, and it still currently exists at places like um, Barnard College at Columbia University. Um, there were other, like Harvard and Radcliffe, um, Pembroke and Brown. So that model sort of set the stage for women's education for a number of years. Um, most coordinate colleges have been folded into the larger university, much like Newcomb College has now been folded into the larger Tulane University. Um, Barnard still exists as a separate entity, but it is a, it's kind of an outlier in that space. So, Newcomb College was a degree-granting institution through 2006. Um, following Hurricane Katrina, all of the undergraduate colleges merged, and Newcomb Institute emerged as the women's slash feminist slash um, invested in gender rights and gender justice entity following that um, following that merger in 2006. So now you are all students at Newcomb-Tulane College um, and participation in Newcomb Institute is for those students that are drawn to talking about uh, gender equity, feminism, feminist research, those sorts of um, endeavors. And so Newcomb Scholars um, emerged in 2009 
um, as a way to keep a curricular component to um, the, the offerings of Newcomb Institute. And so currently the scholars program is the only curricular um, offering through Newcomb Institute, although we do have um, I believe it's like 25 student organizations, lots of different funding opportunities, um, research in uh, research endeavors. Um, uh, we have internships that we fund. So Newcomb Institute does a lot of things outside of the scholars program. And for those of you that are new students, I'd encourage you to definitely read your Newcomb news, get all the information about all the activities that are happening. Um, the scholars is but one component of it. So, um, so the scholars is um, the scholars program are currently taught by faculty that are um, affiliated with Newcomb Institute. Um, this is just a snapshot of all of us that are currently teaching in the program. Um, that photo is really old for me, but uh, but I but you know that's another story for another day. Um, but I'm I've been um, with. Uh, Newcomb Institute since 2011, been teaching in the program since 2013, um, and my colleagues there um, are all coming from a very interdisciplinary background. So my background is in American studies um, and communication with an emphasis on uh, gender and gender communications. My scholarship looks at um, gender and presidential campaign communications. And so while that's been really a hot topic for the last four or five years. I've actually been working in the field for a number of years beyond that. And so, um, so that's my background. Anna Mitchell Mahoney, uh, who teaches the sophomore class, um, is a political scientist who looks at women's engagement in state legislatures. Um, the third year class is taught by, I guess we're almost reverse alphabetical order here. Um, the third class is taught by Claire Daniel and Jackie Howard. Um, Jacqueline Howard is a historian. Claire Daniel is another um, American Studies scholar. And so um, they both teach the Feminist Epistemologies class we'll talk about in a moment. And then uh, Julie Enrique Zaldana, um, is, uh, uh, her background is in organizational leadership and human resources, and she teaches the senior class on women's leadership. So all of us are administrative faculty at uh, Newcomb Institute. All of us have our offices there on the third floor of the Commons. In normal times, the doors always wide open and people are around and are available to drop in and talk about. And I'll let the current students describe that. Um, and we certainly hope that we're able to get back to that frame uh, sooner than later. Um, so, so the Newcomb Scholar Scholars, of course, is not just our faculty, but our students. And so each year we do this recruitment process where we bring in um, approximately 20 students. Um, we really try and shoot for 20, but um, for some years, if we've got really compelling applicants, we try and bring in some more if we can. Um, and so what makes us different from other programs that are available currently for undergraduates is that um, we are we are intentionally feminist. Um, we are um, rigorous. So this is an, it's a program that is on top of whatever your major is and whatever your co, whatever the um, requirements of your current major um, field of study is. And we're interdisciplinary. So each year we have students that are political scientists, art historians, um, studying neurobiology, studying archaeology. We have folks from the business school, folks in architecture. And so we try and bring all of those um, positions and points of view to bear on thinking about what feminist research looks like and what um, feminist leadership specifically looks like. Uh, I think it is a really unique space on campus where we are intentionally looking at these things through a gendered lens. I would also say that um, there are, it is a cohort program. So you're accepted in your first year and you take these courses with all of the other students who are selected along with your cohort. Um, we only do admissions during freshman year um, and you take a seminar each year with the same group of students throughout your four years here. And I think that that really does provide a sense of community, a sense of support, um, and we are intentional in the ways that we try and build that, um, that community with, um, with events, with um, 
with funding to provide events for everyone. And so again, I'll let the students talk a little bit more about that. Um, but we're different than Altman, we're different than the honors program, we're different than other um, uh, disciplinary programs that you would participate in. And, and we are intentionally different in those ways. And we're very fortunate that we have a lot of endowment funding to support those efforts. So, um, so I said, you know, we're a feminist research program, we're a feminist interdisciplinary scholarship program. And so um, just for those folks who want to like, what does that actually mean? You know, I went to the old Miriam Webster, like you do in high school to really frame the conversation here. And so I want to say that, you know, feminism is as defined on the slide. Um, feminism can look like a lot of different things. Um, the theory of the political, economic, and social equality of the sexes. Um, and then organized activity on behalf of women's rights and interests. And I would say that we tend to think about feminism as being more of a social justice project beyond specifically women's rights um, than perhaps Miriam Webster would have defined it. Um, but I, I would say that there is space um, in the scholars program for folks of all political backgrounds. We have um, the president of the Feminist for Life group, as well as plenty of um, reproductive um, abortion rights activists in our senior cohort, for instance. So it's very, um, it's very diverse and it's intentionally diverse in the way that people um, come to the program and the, the, what they're looking to get out of it and what they're looking to bring to it as well. Um, so that's the, the frame through which we're approaching all of our work. Um, and then we, we focus on research. And so what does that mean? That's re your research project is going to look particularly different if you are an environmental biologist versus a political scientist. But it is the, the methodology of um, producing knowledge. I've set a question, I'm going to collect data to investigate that question, and then I'm going to present and provide findings on that question. And so again, um, that'll look different depending on your, your discipline. Um, but we, we are, um, because the faculty members that are affiliated are interdisciplinary, we're trained to think in that way. And so, um, so we'll talk more about that as well. I, it's hard for me to see the chats with my slide share. Are there any chats going on or questions in the chat, Lori? No? Okay. Okay. Does anybody have any questions um, at this point? Okay, um, so feel free to put something in the chat and someone just stop me when I, I just bulldoze over <laughs> for whatever's going on. Okay, um, so what does the program actually look like on the ground for your experience um, as an undergraduate? So as I said, there are four seminars that are required over your four years at Tulane. Um, I teach the first year seminar, which is in the spring of your um, freshman year, and it's on the history and philosophy of women in higher education. It also has a service learning component. Our current service learning uh, partner is Upward Bound, which is a, um, it's a federally funded program, but uh, the program at Tulane works with uh, students in New Orleans public schools, and it's an interesting, um, it's an interesting way in for current students who might not be familiar with the charter school system, who might not be familiar with New Orleans um, and how what Tulane's role in that is. It is an option. Um, so if people are currently fulfilling their first tier service learning, you know, that's fine. Um, but it but it is an option that you can fulfill through this program. Um, my class also um, fulfills uh, the textual and historical perspectives distribution credit that's new. Um, and so, uh, so that's a way for folks that are in the sciences who might not be taking history classes in other fields um, to fulfill that requirement as well. Um, the spring of your sophomore year, you would take the class taught by Dr. Anna Mitchell Mahoney, Women Leading Change. It's cross-listed with political science um, and it fulfills the writing intensive tier two uh, requirement. It's actually um, a case studies class. And so the class is formulated around case studies um, about women leading change through their organizations or in their community. And at the end of the class, the deliverable is that you would produce your own case study. Uh, and you'll obviously know how, you'll be trained in how to do that before, um, before that 
uh, the end of that seminar. And then the ones that are the highest quality at the end of the semester are published in our undergraduate journal, Women Leading Change. And if anyone's interested in um, that, that uh, program, uh, then you can certainly, um, I'm sorry, that publication, all of that is available through the Tulane Library System. So um, that would let give you a snapshot into what um, your previous scholars have produced over the past four or five years. The junior year um, is a uh, class that we're calling Seeking Knowledge, although I believe it's been retitled, so I need to update this slide, but I believe it's now titled Feminist Epistemologies, How Various Disciplines Recognize Truth. And epistemologies is a fancy way to say, how do we know what we know? So for instance, if I'm talking about the moon landing in 1969, a historian is going to have a very different approach to thinking about that than um, someone who's a physicist or someone who is a medical doctor, right? Like their, their discipline will teach them how to think about that particular event. So, um, so we, of course, want you to be feminist scholars and feminist thinkers and want to train you how to do that within whatever your particular discipline is. Um, this class counts um, not only as an elective credit, but also as a race and inclusion distribution credit um, for, Tulane, for the Newcomb Tulane College uh, core curriculum. And then finally, your senior year um, is a one credit seminar. Um, and that is taught by Dr. Julie Enriquez Aldana on gender and leadership. Um, that class, I'll let Abby speak to that class, although it's recently been overhauled um, to move from three credits to one credit. And so um, that's not all you'll be doing your senior year. You'll also be registering for three credits in the fall and three credits in the spring of either independent study or an honors thesis um, that, is, that allows you to produce your own scholarship. And so at the end of your senior year, um, the independent research project will be presented at our Newcomb Scholars Symposium. Typically we do that in person. Last year we did it virtually. Um, who knows what we'll do this year. Um, but each scholar um, will present her uh, work at the Newcomb Scholars Symposium. <clears throat> and um, again, it is interdisciplinary. And so we try and look at um, how, um, how all of these projects are in conversation with one another. Um, it does, if you are in the honors program, there's no um, barrier to participation in both of our um, programs. So the honors thesis would meet the requirements for Newcomb Scholars as well as the honors program. Any questions? No, I mean, I will also say, um, and it just because it, I'm just working on a current student with this. So the final independent research project, oftentimes students think, oh, it's gotta be a paper or, oh, it has to be some sort of written document. We actually are very flexible in what the final project can look like. So we have had a student produce um, a documentary film. She was a digital media production major. She did a film about her family um, and their immigration from China to Jamaica. And she did, took an anthropological lens to that work and that, um, that was able to fulfill her senior project. We've had um, students that have choreographed their own dance projects and that fulfills the senior year project as well. So um, it's not necessarily, you know, a, a hundred page paper or 50 page paper and that's what the final project is. It, there's a lot more latitude for it to look um, different in those regards. So um, just to plant the seeds there, uh, that there is flexibility in that program. Okay. Um, so what are the responsibilities of the students that are admitted? So we do have a GPA requirement. Um, the first year, at the end of your first year, you need to have a 3.25. Um, and then maintain a GPA of 3.4 after the second year and until graduation. The reason we have the GPA requirement is not to be punitive in any way, but to say this is a this is an extra program. So this is something that is in addition to your um, field of studies and your scholarship. If you're falling below those thresholds, you probably should be focusing on whatever your core discipline is, your core reason that you're here at Tulane. And so um, this is certainly not to say that if you fall below that GPA that you, um, you know, we don't give anyone the boot. That's not how it works. Um, we do um, work with students 
We provide um, tutoring if necessary, help get them involved with the Success Center. And so um, this, just to sort of say, again, not a draconian cliff, which we push people off of their GPA falls below that um, level, but to say it is a guideline and a metric that we use. So that's the, that's the sort of performance responsibility. The other uh, responsibility, of course, is that you are in a cohort program. And so you have a responsibility to the other students that are in the program, helping them focus on their own academic interests and goals. And of course, they're committed to supporting you as well. I often um, times think when we're talking about students and they're considering whether or not to apply to the scholars, not everyone wants to be in a cohort program, right? And so like, it's not just feminist, it's not just research, it is also a cohort program. So thinking about just your personal position on, on how, how you wanna engage, how, what you want that, that um, these years of your life to look like. We certainly have students um, who some of their best friends are from the scholars program, they room with the scholars, you know, it is a, a certainly like a really, pivotal part of their social structure, but we also have students who don't do that, <laughs> who, uh, you know, are, are the scholars, they participate in the cohort um, more um, tangentially, but recognize that that is, that is there for them as well. So um, just to, just to throw that out there. Okay. Um, hey, other hey, questions? we did have a question. Yes. Does the senior year project have to correspond to your major in some way? So if you are doing an honors thesis, then it's per that um, is performed within your major. If you are doing an independent study, it can be in any major at all. So there's no real, I mean, an independent study, for me as the director of the scholars program, it really doesn't make a difference to me if you do an honors thesis or an independent study. That's entirely up to you. What I want to see is a project that combines all of the skills that we've taught you over the four years. Um, so, so in short, no, if you choose to do an independent study, it does not need to be within your major. Thank you. Yeah. And we definitely have this year students who are doing independent studies outside of their major, for sure. Okay. Um, students also ask about study abroad. Um, the, we encourage study abroad. Um, I certainly recognize that in our current moment, study abroad is, who knows what study abroad will look like by the time you students are juniors. Hopefully we'll be back on track for that. Um, right now, study abroad is kind of at a standstill, but we're certainly hoping that that will resume at some point. Um, looking forward to what I guess would be 2023, um, for most of you, um, you are certainly welcome to take the full year to study abroad if you choose to do so. If you choose to um, only do a semester, we ask that you do it the fall of your junior year. And this is the result of you know, about 10 years of feedback that tell us that students want to be here on campus in the spring because of Mardi Gras. I wish it was something more highfalutin than that, but people want to be here. Um, and so we, we offer our class um, in the spring because we assume the majority of you will be here for that. It's also strategic in that it sets you up to, as a launch, launching pad to go into your senior year already with your literature review in your back pocket, already with you know, very specific training on how to, um, how to perform research. I will say for those of you who are looking, you know, this year actually we are, because of the pandemic, we are teaching the junior year class in the fall, um, but that's only because we're really hoping that students will be able to go abroad in the spring. But that's very, you know, again, news changes by the day. So, so I would expect that by the time your junior year comes around that the standard option um, will be back in play where that class is taught in the spring. Uh, and then the final project we talked about a moment ago, but yes, you'll present, um, you'll complete and present a two semester research project, either as an honors thesis or an independent study in order to graduate with the program. And so I've been the director for three years. All of my students have finished their final project. Um, it is, yes, and I'm certain that all of them will finish this year. And so um, you, you have four years to, to sort of work up to that. So I don't want it to be perceived as daunting in any way. All right. 
Any other questions? Um, I think you just answered it, but one we had uh, to clarify, if we are in the honors program and must complete an honors thesis, our final year, this project will qualify as an independent study project for the Newcomb Scholars Program? Yes, I, yes. So whatever you do for the honors program will certainly tick the box for me as well on your, on your final project. I mean, essentially what I'm looking for is that you're doing six credits, three in the spring and three, I'm sorry, three in the fall and three in the spring, that you're taking the one credit with uh, Dr. Enrique Zaldana and that um, you're participating in the symposium. And so the honors program, I don't, the honors program has actually just gone through an overhaul that I'm not 100% sure exactly what their requirements are at this moment. I don't believe that you need to do an honors thesis to be in the honors program as of this moment. Um, Abby, I, I don't, you're in the program, is that right? Um, I can talk about my own experience. I, like you, I have no idea what is going to be like protocol after this year. Um, so definitely do, like double check with them. But I know that for me, you don't have to be in the honors program to write an honors thesis, but you have to write an honors thesis to graduate with honors in your major. Um, I, that might be changing after my year, but that's what I know. <laughs> Well, and to complicate it, and so then there's a, you know, your GPA is what dictates Latin honors. So the magna cum laude, summa cum laude, all of that is, that's math, and that's a different setup. So hopefully I answered the question for whomever asked it. I was also going to say that um, after, if you do go forward with the scholars program, like I don't have to take the second year colloquium for honors program, my Newcomb Scholars um, seminar, sophomore seminar will fulfill that. So you don't have to take like two honors seminars unless you're a freshman right now. Yeah, thanks. you have to, oh, sorry. I was no, just gonna say, thanks for pointing that 10, out. 10, 10, 10, 20, and then after that, um, the Newcomb classes like double count. They count for the honors requirement as well. Yeah, and I will, thanks for, Pointing that out, I will update the slides to reflect that. Yes, so you do need to do your your honors colloquium, whatever that is that you're probably enrolled in right now, um, but you don't need to do anything in the spring or your sophomore year. Great. And I had another question of what additional scholars events besides seminars are required over the four year program? Um, okay, besides, so events are, we don't generally require people to attend events. We provide events and opportunities for people to get together. So for instance, um, last year, and I've got some very lovely photos that I'll show in a moment. Um, but so last year we did a writing retreat where we, um, the seniors, I drove a bunch of seniors to um, Alabama to the beach for a writing retreat in the middle of January where they say they had fun. They worked on their project. I'll take their words for it. Um, we also have writing retreats for seniors that are just a lot more mundane than that, which are just every Friday afternoon. Um, we will open up a classroom for students to get together from like 2 to 5 p.m. to work on their own projects. We have a big sis, little sis program that um, typically our graduate assistant will connect a junior or senior Newcomb Scholar with a first year Newcomb Scholar to like sort of, again, in the way that the, I guess that program works. Um, what else have we done? We've done, we do, so Newcomb Scholars are generally on the front line for every, um, like if we have a big ticket speaker that comes and the speaker has dinner with students, the scholars are the first ones that get tapped um, to have those engagements. Last year, um, we had uh, Sonia Sotomayor spoke on campus and a Newcomb Scholar, four students got to ask her a question and one of our Newcomb Scholars was one of those students who got to ask that question. Um, what else? Sophie or Abby, are there other, what else? But none of those programs are required to participate in. I wouldn't say um, there's particular events. I mean, there are events, obviously, lots of events that are planned. But um, in the question section, I'm sure me and Abby can talk more about 
the extracurricular like organizations that are associated with Newcom and then um, internships, research, things like that that Newcom offers. Yeah, I will also add, we typically have a first year retreat, um, which is an off site where we take the students that have been chosen um, in November uh, off site and we do like a full lunch and a day of activities and that sort of thing. Um, Lori and I are going to be working on what that can look like within the constraints of the pandemic. Um, and so, you know, we're, we, we, I, I don't want to do a Zoom thing, but we might wind up doing a Zoom thing. Or if we can only do 10 people at one time, we might do two groups of 10 or something along those lines. Um, but we are, we're thinking about it. I mean, again, we are sort of constrained from doing the cohort stuff as much as we would like to because of the ways that we're all constrained. Um, but it is, it is intentionally woven throughout the program. Other questions? Okay. Um, so what are the, in the seminars, what do the seminars look like? Um, so I'll let you all read the slide. I won't necessarily read it to you, but what I will say, I, I've been teaching the, the first year seminar for a number of years. And essentially what I hear students often say is this is the first class where I get to know the, my fellow students. I get to know the instructor. Um, oftentimes first year classes outside of language classes, but you're in there with, you know, 50 people or 80 people. And if you're taking intro to chemistry or whatever it is. Um, so this is a, this class, they are seminars. It's not um, me standing up lecturing or any of the other faculty members standing up lecturing. Um, we sit around the table, we talk about things. Um, and then again, we're, we're really trying to tailor the assignments that to your interests. And so there's no midterm exam, there's no final exam. The seminars are, you get to pick a topic. For instance, in my class, one of the assignments is that um, you identify an issue facing um, higher education today that um, intersects with race, class, or gender. And so that can, that's intentionally very broad. So I have students who do projects on the student loan crisis. I have students who do projects on um, trans athletes and participating in the NCAA. I have students who do things about um, birth control access on Catholic um, and other religious university um, campuses. So it's, it's intentionally broad. You will work with me to refine your research question and identify resources. Um, but the idea um, is that it's driven by your interest. And so in the year of 2020, um, there are so many issues concerning race, class, and gender um, that I'm really looking forward to, you know, teaching this class in the spring um, with a real lens on intersectional inquiry and thinking about how um, oftentimes higher education is the site where these issues play themselves out, right? Like when we think about this discourse about cancel culture, that's about higher ed. When we think about the pandemic, that's about higher ed. When we think about um, so many of these issues, like they're, the university is the site where these play out. So, so it is intentionally um, flexible for you all. Questions, observations. Okay. Um, so beyond the classroom, you will all, we've talked about the interdisciplinary community with other intellectually curious students. Um, we do have a really robust network of Newcomb alumni and professionals in a wide range of fields. And we present networking opportunities um, for folks. If students reach out to me and say, I'm looking for someone who is an, you know, is a oncologist how, and I'd like to intern with that person, we can make those connections for them. Um, the big thing that folks often ask about is the financial support for research and applied learning grants. And so um, we do have a lot of money. We have a lot of money. Um, when I was an undergraduate, I did not have a lot of money. So anybody telling me that they had a lot of money was hugely attractive. Um, and when I say that we have a lot of money, what I mean is you are eligible to apply for 
um, grants to provide travel for you to do your research, to attend conferences, to take internships that you might not be able to take. Um, so we have students, again, most years, not this year, although we were, were able to fund some internships this year. Um, you know, if you would, you need to be in New York City in order to pursue the research in your field, we can provide money for you that will um, subsidize your rent, that would subsidize your Metro card, those kinds of things. Um, and then finally, we have uh, the opportunity to provide um, relationships with faculty and staff at Newcomb. And so, you know, again, we are a group that are with you for all four years. I check in on all my students all four years. Outside of your major advisor, that's not necessarily a relationship that develops in um, the same kind of way. Um, but it is it is an asset, I think, in a university that is as large and and sort of diverse in terms of methods of of inquiry uh, as Tulane is. Um, so why are you going to spend all your time and energy doing all of these things? This is the, um, I also teach a class on persuasive communications and this is what I would call the what's in it for me slide. So why would you want to do these things? Yes, we're doing interdisciplinary feminist learning. Um, we're doing the research funding and the internship funding. And I've got this up here at up to $3,000 a year, but that can often um, exceed $3,000 a year. And we're often able to scrape up money um, from different pots to provide um, the students that are looking for those kinds of experiential opportunities in different ways. Um, and I would say that not just about Newcomb Scholars, but about Newcomb Institute generally. So for instance, um, in February, Lori and I were able to take 16 students to New York City to go to the um, Barnard College Athena, Athena Film Festival, which is about women's leadership. And we were able to provide hotel and flight accommodations and Metro cards for 16 students to go to New York for three days. And that was, um, that's just sort of, indicative of the kind of uh, activities that Newcomb can support. That's outside of the scholars program. But again, hopefully we'll be able to do that this year. We'll see. We'll see what that looks like. Um, career development skill building. So we do have um, workshops where we do mock interviews. We have workshops where we'll look at your resume. We'll help you work on cover letters. Um, there is uh, how, networking opportunities as well. Lori and I are working currently on some information on how you can uh, sort of a, a, a map for how students can key into all of those things that are happening around the university. But of course, we try and put a feminist spin on all of that and, and really, <clears throat> excuse me, recognize how um, career, your career search can look different um, than other students and how do we, we shape that. Um, the alumni network we talked about, and then again, the connection with your cohort beyond the classroom. So it's not just what happens Tuesdays and Thursday mornings, um, it's also um, what happens with the students outside of the classroom. So, oh, these, okay, so we have, we do, these are some shots. This is the, so um, we did go to Gulf Shores, Alabama in January, not your necessary beach trip where you're out there in your swimsuit notice the blankets and whatever. Um, but the student, we were there for three days. Students brought their own work. Um, it was nice to get out of town and really just sort of have that bonding experience. Um, we had, a, the, this is our senior class. Um, so, so the students that just graduated, um, some are at law school, some are doing Teach for America, some are doing business school. Um, and some are still looking for jobs, <laughs> to be honest. Um, one of our students is currently working on the Biden campaign. I think she's in Wisconsin at this point. Um, but but they are, um, they're all doing their own thing and they all come from very different interdisciplinary backgrounds. So um, this is a shot of one of our networking events with Newcomb alums. Um, this was held at the Beefield Alumni House um, at some point in the last few years. Um, again, really sort of having this opportunity to, to make those connections in ways that you might not otherwise be able to do. Um, this is a shot of the Newcomb Symposium from 2019, um, the class that year. Um, so essentially we will do panels of three Newcomb students um, with a faculty member who moderates the panel. Um, this was a year that we had two students present another student's work. 
Um, and so the ability to really not only understand um, your own scholarship, but your cohort, like that's how closely they worked with one another that they were able to present that material even though she was not able to be there. Um, this is Julia Chin, she's the student who did the documentary um, film. She's currently working with Warner Brothers in a very junior position uh, this year, but she is working in her field. Um, and that film helped her um, certainly secure that position. Um, this is a student who, um, she's currently in Israel on a fellowship. I forget the name of the fellowship, but it's relatively prestigious. Um, she did her senior project on populism, um, a comparative study on populism in um, Bolivia versus uh, France and how different, um, and Germany as well, and how different uh, political systems um, react differently to populist themes. Um, this is Hannah Broussard. This is another year. This is, I think, 2017. Hannah Broussard is currently at um, LSU Dental School. Natasha Navajar, who's on the far right, is at um, Baylor Medical School. And I believe Annie Bell, who's on the far left, she's at Tulane Med School. So this was a panel of like pre-medical students that, that was happening that year. Um, Georgia Barlow, that was also 2018, and she um, is now doing, she is, she's now doing prison abolition work with Operation Restoration, which is an organization based in New Orleans um, that works with incarcerated and formerly incarcerated women and helps them with reentry programs. So um, not just, we're, we're very good at going to school and academic success as well, um, but we also are doing activist work in our communities, so. Um, Sammy Morris was a classic, classic study, classics made, I don't know, she did Latin stuff. It was all in Latin and she studied Latin. Um, and she actually spent a year, um, after Tulane at Oxford doing more stuff in Latin and now she's at Tulane Med School. So I think it's interesting to show that, you know, we don't have, um, you don't necessarily need to be a science major to go on to medical school. We have a student who, um, I don't know that she, there's a photo of her, um, but, the, but we also support many students who are in the Creative Scholars. If you're looking at Tulane's Creative Scholars, um, which is a program um, for students that are in the School of Liberal Arts that are majoring in non-sciences who want to go to Tulane Medical School. I believe they apply their sophomore year, um, but we have several students that are doing that as well. Um, there's a GPA requirement and some core curricular requirements, but, um, but that's something, if you're interested in that, you can look into that as well. So what do scholars do after grad school? Um, just a snapshot here. We have folks at law school. We have folks at med school. Um, we have a recent alum, Kelsey Williams is at Johns Hopkins right now doing, um, extending her work in um, reproductive health. Uh, following on some study abroad work that she did in Kenya um, during her time as a student. Um, we have people that are doing fundraising, people that are doing social media and public relations, um, and then people that are, we have about 100 alums all around, was it 136 alums around the world. They're doing all kinds of interesting things, um, and so many of them would be happy to connect with you um, based on your area of interest. So, Let's see, meet some Newcomb scholars. All right, so I'm gonna stop sharing here for a few minutes and go back to the folks so we can see everyone. Um, so who have we got? We've got Abby and Sophie. Abby is um, a senior. Well, I'll let you two introduce yourselves, say a little bit about yourselves, and then you can answer any questions that come up. Abby, you wanna start? Um, sure. So I'm a senior. I'm from Colorado Springs, Colorado. I'm um, studying political science, gender studies, and French. Um, and I guess a little bit about, I took some notes while you were talking, Dr. Smith. Um, I did do study abroad. Um, a lot of uh, women in my class also did study abroad. There were some who did like for a whole year. I went over the summer. So that's definitely very possible. Um, I am writing my honors thesis, um, so I, you know, have been able to do both of those programs. Um, I also was able to get a grant this past summer to work, to take an unpaid internship in New Orleans. Um, and so, yeah, everything Dr. Smith said, I definitely second 
you know, everything about the cohort based programs, and how like important that is the women in my cohort, you know, we've gotten to know each other really well. And it's, it's like kind of unique. I can't really think of another group that I've like known and been friends with since my freshman year. Um, so, you know, they're definitely very special to me and they're all really like smart, interesting people. There's pe there's a woman writing a, her thesis about like funeral rites in like Crete because she's a classics major. There's, there's people doing like stem cell research. Um, so there's, it's like all sorts of interesting stuff. They're just really interesting, really cool women. And um, I also want to um, echo something Dr. Smith said real quick about um, Newcomb, just like to make sure that you guys are like reading the news, paying attention to the events and like get involved because Newcomb is a really unique and like special thing that Tulane has. So yeah, that's everything. <laughs> Thanks, Abby. Sophie, did you want to say a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, I'm Sophie. I am from Chicago and I'm a sophomore. Um, I'm majoring in public health and gender studies with a minor in social innovation and entrepreneurship. And I'm actually in the Newcomb Institute kitchen right now. Um, I do, I would say that most of the things I do on campus are related to Newcomb. Um, uh, this summer, I was a grant recipient to um, intern with Vela New Orleans and I was a reproductive justice intern. Um, right now, I am starting an internship with Planned Parenthood Gulf Coast, um, and that uh, those internships aren't required to be a Newcomb Scholar, but I'm, that's just an example of how um, Newcomb Institute in general offers a lot of great opportunities. Um, I am also in SAFE, um, which is a Newcomb uh, organization, um, and I am a administrative aide for Newcomb Institute at the front desk. So kind of do everything with Newcomb. Um, and I absolutely love Newcomb scholars. My roommate this year is Amanda. She is a Newcomb scholar as well. And like Abby said, I totally agree. I don't really have any other community like Newcomb scholars. I would say it's all the benefits of be of having like this great community of women who are so different from you but so alike in a lot of different ways and even if I'm not best friends with someone in there um like I am with like my roommate I feel like I learn so much from all the women in my class and people so yep so I'd love to just open it up to the folks on the call to ask them ask the students any questions or or me or any but i think the students probably have more insight to what you're interested in what does the application process look like so I've got one more slide on that, um, but essentially, so there, um, there is an essay portion uh, and that application will open on September 4th, which is Friday. And we read the applications and then we choose to interview based on that pool. Then there's an interview process. And then we usually identify folks before November 1. So you will know one way or the other by no November 1. I'll let, I mean, I, you, the students can talk more about their experiences with the application process in terms of if you have any insights into that. You just did it, Sophie. Yeah, um, I don't remember what the essay was about, um, but I don't think the application process should be anything that discourages you from applying. It's pretty straightforward. Um, and I mean, the interview, obviously interviews are stressful, but I mean, you just talk with Dr. Smith and some scholars and basically they just try and get to know you, like what your interests are, why are you applying? Um, so, I mean, obviously it is like a competitive program to get into, but it's not the application process shouldn't discourage you from applying. So, yeah. I would also, again, it's not intended to be punitive in any way. Um, anybody else have any questions? 
For if you were to be a part of the six year pre law program, would you still be able to participate? So, would you still be able to take the fourth year like seminar and be in the first year of law school at Tulane? I think that you could. I haven't had any students that have done that, but I mean, again, we're pretty flexible in terms of allow, you know, meeting people where they're at so that they can complete their project. We have definitely had architecture students who are, which is a five-year program um, that have gone through and finished their, I mean, the, the question I would say more is one for you in terms of like being able to finish your research project that senior, you know, have that essentially do your senior year slash first year of law school, which I think is doable, um, but would just require a lot of planning and time management in those three years of your undergrad, but I, I'm happy to help you or anyone sort out what that could look like. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Hi, uh, I was wondering what, if someone could expand more on what volunteering with Newcomb Scars looks like. Uh, in, what do you mean volunteering? Like, um, you mentioned the upward bound Thing. Could you expand more on that? Sure. Um, did did one of either one of you do that? I think I did it. Okay. Do you want to talk about that, Abby? Um, yeah. So it counts as your first tier service learning requirement that you need to graduate from Newton Tulane College. Um, and the way that it worked for me, I think we went like once or twice a week for like an hour and a half in the afternoons um and basically just like work with the upward bound students they're all in high school and it's basically just like helping them finish their homework um or like work on projects or work on getting organized for school a lot of what upward bound helps with is also like act or college prep so you might be like helping them work through um so like sometimes you are working with a different student every week and sometimes you like make a relationship with a student early on um it kind of just depends on like your interest level in the program how involved you want to get but um it's it's definitely a good i would say some service learnings are like not super engaged um this is i think this is a good service learning where like you definitely get the experience of working with the community but it's also when i did it, it was on tulane's campus um and so that makes it i think a little bit more manageable for a first year student that you don't have to like get on a shuttle or take an Uber or like bike, you know, across town. So I think that it's definitely a good option if it fits into your schedule. Yeah, and I, I will say so the the office is in the basement of JL residence hall. So yeah, you don't the commute is very easy <laughs> in terms of that. So Thank you. Anybody else have any other questions? Okay, so I, I'm seeing that we're coming up on the hour. Let me just bring up the last little slide here that I have. Um, so I'm um, here are the dates. Yeah, so the application process, um, the link will go live on September 4th, which is this Friday. I think it's it's 8, 8 a.m. on Friday, I'm not sure, but in the morning. And um, it'll be open through September 25th. There's two short answers and one longer essay. And I believe the longest essay is 750 words. It is not a 10 page diatribe on anything by any means. So please don't be put off by the writing the essay part of it. Um, there's the interviews and the selection that we just discussed a minute ago. Um, all of that information is there. It would be fantastic for those of you that are on the call, um, if you could email Lori, just to let her know who was on the call so that we can keep track of who is at the info sessions. Um, and I think her email address is in her name there, but I, or it's either in the chat. Did you put it in the chat, Lori? I will right now. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, larnold2 at tulane.edu. And if anyone has any questions about any of this or the process or the procedure, just reach out to me and let me know. I'm sure Abby and Sophie would also be happy to answer questions. And I would say, um, if you take a look at 
the Newcomb Scholars website. Uh, there are, should be short bios from many, if not all of our students, at the very least what their major is. So if you're interested in being a math major and you see a Newcomb Scholar that's a math major, you could email that person and say, what was that experience like for you? I, I, essentially, they're, they're very happy to share both the, you know, the, the positive as well as the challenges. I would imagine, I, you know, we, we go out of our way to choose folks who say what's on their mind. So if you want an unvarnished, <laughs> if you want an unvarnished look at the scholars program, I would encourage you to reach out to any of the students um, that are on the website and ask them what their thoughts were on that. So um, with that, I look forward to reading everyone's essay. Please, please, please apply. It's, we've got a lot of great things coming up. Um, and so I hope that you uh, are interested in being a part of it. All right, Thank thanks you. so much everyone. Thank you. Take care. I should stop recording, okay.